Tell you Good evening. Day, you know, glad to be together with you. I'm glad we're here as the church. This is the Sussex United Methodist Church. And I'm Dan Gufford, the pastor here at the Sussex United Methodist Church. It's great to be able to be together here in person after such a long time. Also to be able to continue worshiping with people online as you watch from your computers or listen from your phones. Thank you for being here. Let's join together in our opening hymn which is Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. Words are printed in your bulletin. and loving God, we give you thanks for this day and for the opportunity to be together, for being with friends again and able to share their company, for the promise of spring and the hopes that it brings. We give you thanks for all your love for us, for caring for us, for appointing us as your representatives in the world and giving us the job of sharing your love with others in compassion and kindness. Lord, we know there are lots of ways in which we have let you down in the past, <clears throat> ways in which we have failed to do the things that we know we ought to do, ways in which we have failed to avoid doing things that we ought to avoid. Lord, we know that there are times when we have been afraid to share good news with others, to be kind to others, not knowing how they would react. There are ways in which we have just been stuck. But we are confident that you will forgive us if we ask. And so we lift our confessions to you silently at this time. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. Heal us and make us whole and lift us up so that we may have a new birth of freedom and love and joy in our lives so that we can live fully and abundantly in your care. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The good news is that God forgives us whenever we ask and therefore we can all be assured that our sins, yours and mine, are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, this weekend we, we recognize our moms, the mothers in our lives, the ways they have taught us so much, the way they have inspired us. And so we give thanks for all of our moms. And I invite you to pray with me just for a moment. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for all mothers everywhere, for our own moms, especially for those who have brought us up and taught us about your love and taught us the way to live. We ask your blessing on them all. Keep them in your care. Keep them safe now and always. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to take a moment to thank all those who have made donations to our special Mother's Day offering. 
Our Mother's Day offering every year, along with our Father's Day offering, goes to support the United Methodist Homes. Well, it's now called the United Methodist Community because it's broader than just retirement homes. But our help does make it possible for the United Methodist Homes to provide a safe and good place for people to live in retirement and with the assurance that they will never have to leave because their money runs out. We give thanks to all those who have contributed to that and invite you to continue to do doing that. If you send a check to the church for that purpose, let us know what mothers you'd like to honor and mark your check for Mother's Day. And we'll make sure that it goes to that cause and that cause only. Now I invite you to listen for a word from God as we read from the Holy Scriptures. I'm reading tonight from the Gospel according to John in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. This is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He has just begun to gather disciples around him, and he was invited to a wedding. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone jar, water jars from the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, or the servants that had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus said this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there a few days. A word from God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Join in singing that favorite old hymn now, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Why should I feel the Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eyes are on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes are on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing. I 
speak to kids for a moment. If you're watching, I hope you'll remember something your mom has taught you, something you learned. I remember my mom taught me all kinds of things. There were things that she would say over and over again, and they stuck with me. I can remember them as if it were yesterday. She would say, I know you're embarrassed, but you need to go across the street and say hello to the new kid who just moved into town. You need to be nice to people who have no friends. And I would shuffle my feet and try to find a way out of it because I was embarrassed. I found it hard to go and introduce myself to people. I found it hard to talk to kids I didn't know. What if they didn't like me? What if they were unfriendly? What if they were mean kids? She always insisted that I be the first one to say something nice. And that was really good advice. It made all the difference as I've grown up. You can make friends with lots of people of different kinds if you just try. Because a lot of times they're very shy themselves and may be afraid to say hello to us as well. Second thing she always said was that we need to get over the ways in which we feel hurt. Our feelings hurt. We feel like we have gotten the wrong end of a rule or a bargain or somebody saying something to us that was mean, somebody teasing us in the playground or saying something behind our backs. We need to forgive, she would say. Because if we don't forgive, eventually everybody will be mad at everybody. And where will we be then? We have to be able to forgive people. But be the first one to reach out as a friend and be the first one to try to forgive the third thing she would always say was that we have to follow Jesus. Whatever we do, we have to follow Jesus and do what he says. Because Jesus teaches us to love. Jesus teaches us to be kind and loving and caring. Jesus us, he teaches us all the ways in which we need to live. So if we want to know what to do, and we want to know how to care for other people, we look to Jesus' example and try to be like him. If we always try to be like Jesus, we'll always have a good sense of what to do in pretty much any situation. And I think it's easy enough to tell what Jesus would do in most circumstances. There are things that we can't find anything about what Jesus thought of, this or that. We can't find out whether Jesus would have us pick to drink Coke or Pepsi, or what kind of breakfast cereal to eat, or any of those kinds of things. We don't know what Jesus ate. We know he ate bread, but so does everybody else, I think. What we do know is that Jesus always wanted people to be nice to others and wanted us to do the same thing. Jesus especially loved children. And when people tried to keep children away from him so that they wouldn't bother him, I guess, 
He always insisted that people let the children come to him. Let the children be with him. Because maybe he loved being around kids most of all. I think that's a wonderful thing. It always makes me feel good to know that Jesus would want to be around me, no matter how big I was, no matter how old I was. But Jesus loves all of us. And that's a good example in everything we do. So let's remember that. Let's be the first ones to try to be a friend to somebody. Let's be the first ones to try to forgive and, and make peace. And let's be the first ones to try to follow Jesus in all the things that we do. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for Mom's teachings, for Mom's reminders of how we should live. We thank you for all the ways in which you care for us, just like a parent, that you love us and care for us and show us the way to live. And we pray that we'll always be able to do that well and faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this account that we've read about Jesus at the wedding in Cana is a story that's been told again and again. It's remembered by people who are Christians. It's remembered by people who have never been in a Christian church. Whatever they may know about Jesus, they've heard the story of him turning water into wine. But actually, the idea of changing water into something else is probably the least important or least interesting thing about the story. Jesus story here, the thing that Jesus is about here, is a much bigger thing than that. And we can learn a lot from what happens in the connection with this story. The first thing you notice is that there is a big event, a big happy party event. Not something you would normally think of as a deeply somber religious sort of gathering. This is not Jesus sitting on the mountainside teaching disciples. This is not Jesus calming waters as the disciples flounder in the lake. It's not Jesus in the temple standing up to the authorities. It's just a celebration. It's a wedding. It's a, it's a party. And in Jesus' time, parties for weddings went on and on and on. Sometimes, I think for days, people would gather because they'd have to travel long distances to get there. Everybody would come. They would have a big, big party, and it was very important for the family that was hosting that party to have plenty of food and plenty of drink. That's still true today when you think about it. If you have a party, people expect you to have enough for everyone who's invited. It would seem very strange to be at a party and go up and ask for some of the food to eat and say, oh, I'm sorry, I invited 10 people, but I only got enough food for five, so there's not enough for you. That would feel like you weren't thought of as, as important as the other people invited to the party, right? It would be upsetting. It would be, if nothing else, it would leave you hungry. And when I get hungry, I get grumbly. They were there and ready for the party, and the family had run out of, out of wine. And this was something that was going to be a big embarrassment to that family. It was a social blunder of major proportions to run out of food or run out of drink for all the, all the people who were guests at the wedding party. And Jesus, at the moment, didn't seem to be paying much attention to it. This was simply the details and logistics of the party. But Jesus' mother noticed Jesus' mother went over to him very quietly and told him, they have run out of wine. There's no more wine. And Jesus says, well, that's not, that's not our problem. That's an issue for the family. Who's running the party? But Mary, Jesus' mother, was having nothing of that. She was not going to let him not be responsible for helping people who were in danger of great embarrassment people who are going to lose face, people who are going to be thought of poorly by all the guests because they didn't have enough refreshments. She knew that it was important to save face 
for that family. Important to avoid them being humiliated and embarrassed. Doesn't sound like a big thing, but sometimes the little humiliations in our lives loom very large for us. Sometimes we can carry those memories for a long, long time. Sometimes other people's memories of us in those situations can linger for a long time too. And she insisted that because she knew Jesus could do something about it, he should. Because he could do something about it, he should. Now he could try to wiggle out of it. You can imagine him like the teenager shuffling their feet all over. Mom, it's not my job. Mom, leave me alone. It's not my time. I'm going to introduce my ministry later. This is not the time. Instead, she paid no attention to him, as moms often do. I can remember the same feeling when I would try to wiggle out of going and seeing the new kid across the street. My mom would not let me get out of it either. Instead, Jesus' mother turns to the servers and says, you do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. That's the crux of the story. Not what Jesus does, but what the servants do. Because they follow her command, and they do what he tells them to do. Do whatever he tells you to do. That sounds like my mom. Do what Jesus tells you to do. So Jesus told the servants, you see those huge containers for water? How much did it say they held? I'm Pretty probably picturing a jug of wine as being about the size of a liter, right? Maybe a quart? No, these are, these are stone jars that hold 20 to 30 gallons. Those are huge. Huge. Just fill them all up. Now imagine how much time that would take. Imagine how much work it would take to fill up containers that big. Six jars times 20 gallons at the bottom end. That's a lot of water to draw from the well. That's a lot of water to use to fill these up. And they did. Because she had told them, do whatever he says. And when they did, Jesus then told them, take that to the, to the steward, to the one who's in charge of the feast, like the head caterer. Go take it to him. And they did, and everything was changed. You saw the, the amazement. People usually save the, be the best for first when people have not dulled their taste buds. You save the best now for last. And people might not even care about the quality of the food in front of them. When you're almost full, when you have drunk your fill, almost, you don't care as much about the quality of the taste as the first sip. But they said, you have saved the best for last. That means you, the host, you, the father of the people getting married, you, the father, you are the ones who have saved the best, which shows you are amazingly generous. So the family went from being on the verge of humiliation on the verge of total and terrible embarrassment to being thought of as the hosts with the most, the hosts with amazing abundance, the hosts who have not only plenty for everybody and way more than plenty, because how many gallons can your guests drink? More than anybody could possibly need. And it's the best yet. It's the best yet. These are the best hosts. This is the, the host that is serving the very best, even at the last. I've heard great old jokes about saving the best for last. You have too, I'm sure. But that's where this, that line comes from, right here in the Bible, right here in the Gospel according to John. And the point of it is not just that it's the best, not just that it's there at the end. The point is that there is amazing abundance in following Jesus. When the servants do what Jesus asks, when they follow his direction, when they go to all the effort, and it's a huge effort to fill those jars, when they go to all that effort, when they expend themselves that much, when they care that much, when they follow the instructions that he gives them, amazing things happen. 
that amazing abundance can be ours as well. Ours not just to use for ourselves, but ours to share as well. It's very easy for churches nowadays to get caught up in all the things that we don't have, all the ways in which we feel the pinch of scarcity. We don't feel we have enough money. We don't feel we have enough people. We miss terribly the people who are no longer among us. We feel we don't have enough youth, enough kids. We don't have enough prosperity in our town. We don't know how to handle these problems because we don't have enough knowledge. There are so many ways in which we feel inadequate to the times. But listen to this story. Listen to this account because it's not about wine. It's about abundance. It's about the abundance in our lives and the amazing things that can be happening with us when we follow Jesus. When we give ourselves over to his cause and follow his leadership, follow his example and his direction, amazing things can happen. Our resources, our abilities, our strength can be multiplied many times over many times beyond what we think we can be. It's, you can think of times in your life, I'm sure, when you have done something that felt risky. It felt like it might not work. Maybe it was talking to that new neighbor. Maybe it was offering forgiveness to somebody who had said something really unkind. Maybe it was offering a favor, taking somebody to the doctor, getting groceries for somebody, offering a gift card to somebody who seemed down and out. It doesn't seem like that big a deal to us. And then we can see that it has an amazing impact. And we have abilities to do things that touch people's lives that we had no idea we could do. That is the amazing abundance that comes with putting in the time, putting in the effort, following the instructions and guidance and the example of Jesus. If we do that, do what Mary says, do whatever Jesus tells us, follow that leader, we can be in a life that is filled with an amazing abundance beyond everything we imagine. I'm not talking about getting rich. Let me hasten to add that. This is not some kind of prosperity preaching that says if you just trust Jesus all your troubles will go away. If you just trust Jesus you'll have more money than you need. If you just trust Jesus you can build that extra house or buy that extra car. No, nonsense. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that we can have the amazing ability to influence the world, to change the, the direction of history to transform the world in love, transform the world in hope. We can change the world if we put our effort to it when we are following the one who sent us, when we are in that effort. Amazing things can happen to the world. I'm not talking about getting rich. I'm talking about changing the world. This is our cause. This is our hope. This is our confidence when we do what Jesus tells us. Why? Because Jesus loves us, loves you, and loves me, and will never let us go. And loves the world, too. And that's why we're here, to carry that love to them. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks for all your blessings. We thank you for bringing us safe to this day and for calling us to be your people, for reminding us to be your representatives of kindness and love in the world. We give thanks for our moms and our mothers everywhere who have taught us so much. We rejoice in our ability to learn and to remember about that teaching. We rejoice in our plans to baptize Cheryl Fisher next week. We're excited about that. We give thanks for the appointment of our new pastor, Tim Mazinski, who will 
begin leading this church upon my retirement in July. But we also pray for his current congregation up in Waterloo United Methodist Church. And we ask you to care for them, to guide them and strengthen them, to give them good leadership as well, so that we may all transform the world in your love, not through our own strength, but through your amazing abundance. Lord, we give thanks for those who have given of their time and energy for the mission of this church to care for others. We care for those who we brought clothing for family in need. We brought food for families who need it. We brought gift cards for people who need it. And we give thanks for all that effort and ask you to redouble our strength and courage. We know there are many people who need you this week and we pray especially for them. This week we pray for Barbara Miller's brother, Reverend Frank Fowler, pastor in the Trinity in Hackettstown United Methodist Church. He's been diagnosed with a rare brain disease, quite called Baker's disease. And we pray for all of his family, for all of his congregation, and all those who have taken inspiration from his work. We pray also for the Shepherd's family as they mourn the death of these and Susie and Ian Kimball. We pray for Jean's friend, Minnie Smith, who's in the hospital. We continue to pray for Rich and Debbie Cron, Rich is in rehab in Atlanta after a neck injury. And Debbie is traveling to Atlanta this Sunday to be trained in his care. And be, they'll both be heading back to New Jersey around May 12th. So we pray for traveling mercies for them and continued recovery. We continue to pray for Marie, who's recovering at home after a trip to the hospital, for Jean's Aunt Carol, for 11-year-old Sophie, who's beginning chemotherapy, and for all those who are sick or dealing with health issues, and there are so many. We pray for all those who are suffering with COVID-19, for Rich Steffi's friend, Russ Triano, who's been in the hospital on a ventilator. And we also continue to pray for all those who are recovering from the disease and those who are dealing with the pandemic in every way. Pray for the people in India and Southeast Asia who are having so much suffering now. And for doctors and nurses and other care workers and everybody who's dealing with the pandemic in every way. We pray for those who mourn the loss of friends and loved ones. We pray, as I mentioned, for the family of Eileen Kimball, for the family and friends of Debbie Goddard's and Sparta family's grandmom, for those who mourn Pat Tradish, Joan Little, and Francis Gepner, and for all those who have suffered loss. We pray for all those facing hard times and facing disasters and dangers. We pray for your church, for all the country's leaders, for our military servicemen and women, for all our those who seek to keep the public safe, all our first responders and caregivers. We know you care for us all and promise never to abandon us. And so it's with the confidence of children in our own home that we pray the words you taught us to say in the Lord's Prayer, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So now is the time we need to step up and be the church, to respond to this good news we have heard, to care for others, and do all that we can to help. We need to support this work in all that we do, in our gifts to the church, in our presence in the church, in our prayers with and for the church, and our witness to the town, the community, and the country around us, all the people who need to hear of God's love. We need to be able to go into the world with confidence and with hope. We continue to gather clothes for those who need clothes. We continue to gather food for those who need food. 
we continue to help others in every way we can. If you're watching online or listening remotely, I hope you'll continue that work too. Give your heart to Jesus Christ and do it now. If you haven't done it before, do it now, whether anybody sees you or hears you or not. If you've done it before, renew that commitment now. This is an opportunity that we have to change everything by being the voice, the hands, the feet, Christ in the world and sharing love wherever we go. I hope you'll continue that work. I hope you'll continue to help us and help others all around so that we can together make a difference in our community and in our world. Let's go with confidence. Let's go with the confidence of those who know that Jesus cares about us, not just as a group, not just in the abstract as part of the world, but individually as well. Let's sing that favorite beloved old hymn that tells of the life and the experience of Mary Magdalene at the time of the resurrection, the great hymn in the garden. to love and serve the Lord, but also to love and serve all those around us, to care for those who need a word of hope, who need help in many other ways, who need friendship, who need the life that we have been given. We can share all those things without worrying about reaction, without worrying about anything, because we know that wherever we go and whatever we do, 
and whatever happens to us, the love of God, the parent of us all, the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit will go with us and abide with us, now and always. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.